You don't have to answer this question out loud, but I want to begin by asking you to think of some really big sins. What are, what are the big sins? Now, look, I know that when we're in Bible class that you know that the correct answer to that question is, oh, there's no sins that are bigger than any other sins. They're all the same in the Lord's eyes. But guys, for just a moment, let's be honest. You know you think there are some sins that are bigger than others. You know you do. We all do. In fact, we know that there are thinking in our own minds there are some big sins and there are some little sins. And sometimes we justify those little sins because at least we didn't commit the big sins. And if we can all just be honest, we tend to think that the sins of speech are some of the little sins. And we say things to ourselves like, look, I know I yelled at my wife, but at least I didn't cheat on her. You know, I get it that I cussed my boss, but at least I didn't steal money from the company. Ah, uh, I know I gossiped about my neighbor, but it's not like I killed him. Besides, besides, it's just talk. It's just talk. It's not that big of a deal. Besides, I was angry. It shouldn't matter. Besides, I was tired. I couldn't control myself. Besides, I was hungry. You know how I get when I'm hungry. Besides, everybody talks like that. Besides, I'm only human. Besides, besides, besides. And we make excuses and justifications for the things that we say and for our unbridled speech. And besides, here we are singing praises to God. Here we are praying to God. Here we are preaching messages from God's word. I mean, surely, hey guys, those two songs we just sang and then the ones before the prayers, doesn't that just make up for it? Surely that makes up for all the stuff that we said throughout the week. And then I come to James chapter 1 and verse 26. In James chapter 1 and verse 26, if anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Surely my religious practices, my songs and my prayers and my preachings make up for the things that I say throughout the week at home and on the job and in the school and among my neighbors. No. No, in fact, James says the exact opposite. Not only do our praises here in this room not make up for the things that we say every place else, those things that we say every place else, the unbridled speech makes what we do here worthless. Now, guys, I don't have time to preach all the sermons that will hopefully not cause us to just completely give up today. We've preached those sermons before. As with every kind of sin, sins of the tongue and sins of speech, our job is progress. God's job is perfection. I know that it's about growth. And so there's not any part of me today that's saying, if you said bad things this week, you might as well leave right now and you might as well give up. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that at all. But I do want us to understand that when it comes to sins of speech, we must be growing. We must be picking up arms against the sins of the tongue. And I have just one thing. There, there's lots of things we need to say about speech and sins of the speech. And we'll probably come back and talk about various things about this. But today, from James chapter 1, verse 26, and then also from James chapter 3, I want to provide for you five reasons why we must stop making excuses for unbridled speech. We've got to stop making excuses for it. We've got to stop dismissing it. We've got to stop acting like it doesn't matter. The things that we say matter. And the things that we say impact us. An unbridled speech, we've got to bridle that. We've got to be growing in that. We've got to be conquering and overcoming. And I want us to see this from what James says here in James 1.26. And from the scripture reading we had just a moment ago from James chapter 3, verses 1 through 12, five reasons why it really matters what we say and why we have to stop making excuses. Before we look at that, would you bow with me in prayer, please? God, you are magnificent. 
You are worthy of praise. You are worthy of every ounce of praise we've given you this morning and so much more than that. We cannot even come close to praising your worthiness. We cannot even come close to singing your greatness. We're trying so hard, Lord. We pray that you would accept what we've offered to you this morning. And we are sorry because we realize that throughout this week we have had unbridled speech. Whether it's with foul words or cursing other people or, or names or yelling in anger or gossip or slander or lying. So many things that we have allowed ourselves to get involved in. Lord God, we, we don't want that to make what we do here worthless. And so we're going to ask you today to be in our hearts, to be in our minds, to give us new hearts and clean minds, and that you would give us clean mouths, that you would bridle our tongues, that you would give us the will to serve and glorify you, not only when we're in this room, but with everything that we say. And help us today to be impressed with how important it is to take up arms against unbridled speech. Help us to be impressed today with how we must not make excuses. And Father, we ask that you would forgive us because we need your forgiveness. But we also ask that you would strengthen us so that we can have victory and overcome. We pray, Father, that you would break the teeth of our enemy. We pray that you would rip off the claws. We pray that you would crush him and defeat him before us. That we might bring glory and praise to you everywhere we go. Lord God, may we be fresh springs. And may your Holy Spirit bubble up within our hearts and pour forth with living water in the way we behave and in the way we speak. Lord God, help us today to be more like your son, to speak like him, to speak as from your spirit, to speak the way you would have us to. We love you, Father. Thank you for loving us first. It is through your son, Jesus, who spoke with perfection and bridled speech that we pray. Amen. Stop making excuses for unbridled speech. Look, point number one, not as if it's bad enough to find out from James chapter one and verse 26 that our unbridled speech throughout the week makes what we do here worthless. When we actually find out what it is that James is really saying there in James chapter one and verse 26, we find out that it's actually much, much worse. Because when I say to you that unbridled speech makes what we do here worthless, we might have the idea that like on a scale from good to bad, worthless is just neutral. It's just helpless. It, okay, it's not helping anything, but that's not what James is saying. James is not saying that unbridled speech just makes this unhelpful. What he actually says is that it makes it positively, or maybe I should say negatively, harmful. This term that is used here for worthless can be used in lots of different ways. In fact, you know, you could talk about grasping the wind as futility and worthless. We find in 1 Corinthians, maybe we do, we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 20. We find in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 20, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise that they are futile. There's our word. Now, so it can be used in that way. However, when this word is used to talk about religion, you may be surprised to see what it normally and usually describes. In the New Testament, the other place where this is used to describe religion, in Acts chapter 14 and verse 15. In Acts chapter 14 and verse 15, when the priest of Zeus and the townspeople want to offer sacrifices to Paul and Barnabas as if they are Hermes and Zeus, this is what Paul says to them. Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you, and we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. You see what he's calling vain things? It's the worship of idols and the worship of false gods that is vain religion. It is the worship of Zeus and Hermes that is worthless religion. Interestingly, when the Greeks translated the Old Testament and produced what we have call the Septuagint. They use this word. They use this word to talk about religion. I'm going to quote now from the Lexham English uh, Septuagint second edition. So this is an English translation of the Greek translation of the Bible that you, English Bible you have. He appointed for himself, Second Chronicles 11:15. This is talking about Jeroboam. Remember when Jeroboam got his 
northern kingdom. And God said, look, you send people back to Jerusalem to worship. But you remember what he did? Some of you remember. If you haven't read this story, I, I encourage you to go back and look at this. What Jeroboam did was, oh, no. If I let them go back to Jerusalem, they'll end up following the king down in Jerusalem. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up two golden calves in Bethel and Dan. Here's how they're described in 2 Chronicles 11:15. He appointed for himself priests of the high places and the images and the worthless things and the calves which Jeroboam made. That's our word. Worthless. This is worthless religion. We find it again in 1 Kings chapter 16 and verse 13 talking about kings who followed in the footsteps of Jeroboam, where your English translation of the Hebrew scripture says idols. Look at what it has here. Concerning all sins of Baasha and Elah, his son, so that he caused Israel to sin to provoke the anger to the Lord God with their pointless things. There it is. And then a few verses later in verse 26, he walked in every way of Jeroboam. This is talking about Omri, the most wicked king that ever was up to this point. He walked in every way of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, and in his sins that he caused Israel to sin to provoke the Lord God of Israel with their pointless things. Where the Hebrews had idols, the Greeks saw this as pointless things. And then in 2 Kings chapter 17 and verse 15, when describing why God conquered, defeated, destroyed, and allowed Assyria to take the northern kingdom of Israel captive, he explained this is the reason. And his testimonies that he warned them with, and they walked after the pointless things where the Hebrews had idols. And that's what your English translation, I think, has there. They became pointless. Also after the nations that surrounded them concerning which he commanded them not to do according to these things. They went after pointless things and they became pointless. Just so you know, technically that second one is the verb form of this word family. But it's that same I was about to say it's that same point. Maybe I should say it's that same pointless. Guys, do you see what this is saying about worthless religion? He says, well, he says, if you don't bridle your tongue, it makes your religion pointless, worthless. James was a Jewish Christian steeped in these Hebrew scriptures, likely having read them in this Greek translation. He was writing to Jewish Christians who would have been steeped in the Hebrew scriptures, likely having read in the Greek translation. And so when James wrote to them and said, if you don't bridle your tongue, it makes what you do as your religion. It makes your religious practice pointless. It makes it worthless. He's saying it basically makes you idolaters. Sure, you're calling out the name of God. You're saying the right things, but you might as well be doing it to the golden calves in Bethel and Dan. You might as well be doing it to Zeus and Hermes for all the good that it's doing God and for all the good that it's doing you. Unbridled speech makes us idolaters. We must stop making excuses for unbridled speech. We continue in James chapter 3. In James chapter 3, he says in verse 1, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness, for we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. They are the, though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. I sure hope you're following along in the scripture. I really like for you to see this. If you need a pew Bible, this is found on page 1011 or maybe 1012 right there. But this is James 3. Do you hear what, what he's saying here? Guys, this is interesting to me. James comes back and he starts talking about teachers and he says, not a lot of you should be teachers. Why? Well, because teachers get judged with greater strictness. And why then do the teachers need to be worried about that? Because we all stumble in many ways. And we're all going to stumble in what we say. And we say to ourselves, ah, this is the warning. You shouldn't have many teachers because if a teacher stumbles in what he says, what's he going to do? He's going to lead other people astray. And that's true. And that's certainly bad. But guys, that is not what James says. James doesn't say, don't be a teacher because you'll stumble in what you'll say and you'll lead other people astray. Did you actually catch what he said when he said the real big problem was for people who stumble in what they say? 
Did you catch those two illustrations he used? He said, what do we do with horses? We put bits in their mouths so that we can do what? So that their whole bodies will obey us. And then he gave us another illustration. He talked about ships. He said, the ships are really large and they're driven by great winds, but they're directed by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. Do you catch what he's saying? You know, he says, look, this is the danger. Sure, yes, it's bad for teachers to stumble in what they say and they might lead somebody else astray. But James says, look, here's the real problem. The real problem with unbridled speech is unbridled speech leads to unbridled behavior. He says, if you're stumbling in what you say, it is going to lead you to stumble in what you do. This is the real problem. And this is the amazing thing to me. We come to James chapter three to talk about how she, we shouldn't speak because of what our speech will do to everybody else. But I want you to notice every step of the way, what James says is you need to see what your unbridled speech is doing to you. What it's doing to you. Not so much what everybody else's unbridled speech is doing to you and not necessarily what your unbridled speech is doing to everyone else is you need to understand what it's doing to you. It's making you an idolater and it is going to lead you to unbridled behavior. Unbridled speech leads to unbridled behavior. Godless speech leads to godless behavior. Worldly speech leads to worldly behavior. This little tongue in our mouths is like a bit and it leads our whole bodies. And we say to ourselves, oh, it's not a big deal. It's just talk. It doesn't matter. It's not like I was going to do that. And yet what James says, that's exactly what will happen. Our bodies follow the direction our mouths speak. One of the greatest lessons that I learned from the 12-step recovery community, you know, those groups that get together to try to help people overcome addictions and compulsive sins. He said, if you want to overcome addiction, you have to stop using the language of addiction. And when they're talking about language of addiction here, they're talking about the kind of language addicts use when they're living in their addiction and they're pursuing their addiction. The kind of stories they tell, the slang they use, the jokes they share. Here's the thing. If a recovering alcoholic continues to tell the three men walk into a bar jokes, eventually he's going to walk into a bar. If the recovering sex or porn addict continues to talk of other people in sexualized ways and continues to tell the sexualized jokes, that addict is going to go back to his sexual immorality. The gambler who continues to regale folks with the stories of his biggest scores is eventually going to go back to the gambling. Here's the thing. You know, we often say when people are bragging, well, you can talk the talk, but can you walk the walk? Brothers and sisters, friends and neighbors, here's what you need to understand about sin. Is that if you talk the talk, eventually you will walk the walk. And that's what James says is the big deal here. James says this is a big deal. You need to understand unbridled speech leads to unbridled behavior. We have to stop making excuses for unbridled speech. And James continues in verse 5. So also the tongue, I'm in James 3, so also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire, and the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. Here in this passage, he actually reminds us of what he had said about religion back in chapter 1 and verse 26. If you flip that page and go back, remember, he said, If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Then he goes on to tell us about pure and undefiled religion. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. We'll talk about visiting orphans and widows in another lesson. Here I want us to see this notion of pure and undefiled religion means being unstained from the world. But did you catch what James said about the tongue in James chapter 3? It is a world of unrighteousness. The tongue that is unbridled is a world of unrighteousness. And though it is a very small member of our bodies... Though it is a very small member of our bodies, he says that when the tongue is stained, when the speech is stained, it stains the entire body. 
You know, maybe if our big toe is stained in worldliness, maybe that's just a little bit of worldliness. Maybe that'll just stay in the big toe. Maybe. But he says in the tongue, in the speech, he says, look, speech, unbridled speech stains our whole life. And we like to think it's not that big of a deal. I was just talking. I didn't even mean it. It was just a slip of the tongue. And he says, you need to understand the stain of your speech doesn't just stay in your mouth. It stains your entire body. The whole thing becomes stained with the world. And do you remember what pure and undefiled religion is? Staying unstained from the world. But he also says this. It's set on fire. And did you catch by what? I mean, again, we, we sometimes like to dismiss our speech as if it's not that big of a deal. I, you know, hey, I was just talking. But he says it's set on fire by hell itself. It's not neutral. It's not neutral. And when our tongue is set on fire by hell itself, it sets on fire by hell our entire lives. We may think, I got all my behavior under control. It's, you know, it's just my tongue. I'm only human, you know. But what he says is that is staining your entire life. It is setting on fire the entire course of your life. And it's setting it on fire by hell. But now, guys, in these last two, there's a little bit of good news. I hope you're picking up on this. Because if unbridled speech leads to unbridled behavior, and if unbridled speech stains our whole lives, you know what bridled speech does? It leads us to bridled behavior. And it goes a long way to getting the fires of hell out of our life. You, you want to work on those sins? Start, start working on, on where you talk. Start, talking on, start working on how you talk. Man, that'll help. All those things where you're struggling and stumbling and falling and you're like, I don't understand why I keep doing this. Think about what you think and think about what you say. It'll go a long way to moving toward that pure and undefiled religion. Guys, we need to understand unbridled speech stains our whole lives. We've got to stop making excuses for unbridled speech. And James continues. James continues. Verse 7, For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. Now, I'll admit it. This is the big pink elephant in the passage. Don't get distracted. We'll come back to it at the end. We'll come back to this at the end, okay? Let's keep reading. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Now, I get it. Abusive speech can damage other people. I understand that. And we need to not be damaging other people with our words. I, I will say, though, I hope that as we grow to maturity in adulthood, we will learn in adulthood. I, I get it if we're talking about kids, they don't have the maturity to deal with this. And sadly, we get trained in this as kids. But as adults, we do need to understand that other people's abusive speech actually can only hurt us if we let it. If we let it. Guys, abusive speech is not the same as if they took a bat to your head. If they take a bat to your head, it's going to hurt you no matter what. If they say you're a jerk, it's only going to hurt you if you let it. You don't have to let it. You don't have to let it. Now, I know that means that most of us are going to have to walk through some, some issues that we grew up with in our childhood. I'm not saying it's easy. But I think we need to understand that. Because I'm going to tell you here in James 3, despite the fact that I hear people go to James 3 to talk about how damaging our words are to other, other people, that's actually not what James talks about. He actually doesn't say that. And I'll tell you what, he, what else he doesn't talk about. He doesn't talk about how everybody else's words are damaging to us. As I want you to notice what he says. Here's what he says. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Now we automatically, we hear that, we think, yes, when, I, when people say those evil things, they're, they're filling me with poison. No, 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 no. Listen, listen, where is this poison? It's in your mouth. Do you catch that picture? 
The tongue is a restless evil. It is full of deadly poison. And where do you have that? Where do you have that? In your mouth. Do you understand the point that James is making? The point that James is making is not, look, when you say mean things, it hurts other people. That is true. That is true. Don't do that. Don't hurt other people with your speech. But that's not what James is saying. What James is saying is unbridled speech kills us. When we allow our tongues to be unbridled, we are keeping the poison in our mouths. If I ha- Maybe I should have done this. I should have brought a bottle of poison here as an illustration. And just ask, anybody, who wants to drink it? Who wants to drink it? Of course you wouldn't want to drink it. You wouldn't want that. You wouldn't want to put the poison in your own mouth. But what he says is, is when you have an unbridled tongue, guess what you've got? You've got poison in your own mouth. Do you see what James is saying? James is saying this is a big deal. Yes, we don't want to hurt other people, but you need to understand why it's such a big deal that you got to get your tongue bridled because your unbridled speech is killing you. I know we think everybody else's unbridled speech is killing us. He says that's not the problem. What's killing you is your unbridled speech. Our unbridled speech is killing us. We've got to stop making excuses for our unbridled speech. And finally, as we keep reading in James, verse 9, with it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God, From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. In this one, he goes back to what he had said in chapter 1 and verse 26. If anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Because you see here he comes to saying, look, with our tongue we bless God. What have we been doing here this morning, guys? In fact, what's that last song we just sang? Blessed be your name. I mean, what we were doing, we were were literally, specifically blessing the name of God. He says, with our, with our mouths, we bless God. And with the same mouth, we curse people that he made in his own image. My brothers and sisters, he said, these things ought not be so. He said, it, should, it shouldn't be like this. It should not be like that. Why? He says, look, have you ever seen a fountain? It's either fresh water or it's salt water. It's not both. It's not both. Guys, do you see what James is pointing out here about our speech? See, we like to dismiss our speech. We like to say, hey, it's just words. It's just talk. It's not like I was going to do anything like that. It's not like it's who I am. It's just what I said. And James says, no, no. Unbridled speech reveals unbridled hearts. It's exactly who you are. He says, that's exactly who you are. Your, Your speech says who you are. So he goes on and he borrows an image from his brother where he says, can you, can you, can you get grapes from, can you get figs from a grapevine? Of course not. Of course not. You can't do that. Does a fig tree bear olives? Of course not. How are you going to know what kind of tree it is? We're going to look at the fruit. If it's got figs on it, Dig it up, throw it away, plant something else. Because it's a fig tree. If it's got grapes on it, it's a grapevine. It says you know the tree by the fruit that it produces. And then it comes back with the final statement that just nails it down. He says, neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Brothers and sisters, friends and neighbors, please understand what he's saying there. What he's saying there is you can't go to a pond 
that is a saltwater pond and find fresh water. And this is our problem. We like to think that because here today we are pouring forth fresh water, blessing the name of God, that it means that really we're a freshwater pond. But if what we do is leave here and go home and start spewing out salt water at our spouse and our kids, spewing out salt water at our neighbors, spewing out salt water at our classmates, spewing out salt water at our coworkers and our employers and our employees, what he says is, look, you need to understand what you are as a saltwater pond. And the fact that you did some freshwater things here, it seemed like actually, no, what that did is made even what you did here, salt water. Because I'm telling you, your unbridled speech reveals unbridled hearts. It says who you really are. Jesus, Jesus made this point back in Matthew chapter 12, verse 33 through 35. Either make the tree good and its fruit good or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you're evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. He says, look, our speech says what our heart thinks. And I get it, I get it. I'm sure that, as with every rule, there are exceptions. I mean, I know there really are times where we said something. It's like, oh, no, that's I I didn't mean that the way that sounded. I know that happens. But we need to understand that's a rare exception. What James and Jesus both say is... Our unbridled speech reveals, identifies, defines who we are. It reveals unbridled hearts. And so look, we've got to quit making excuses for unbridled speech. I know we think the speech is just a small thing, a little white lie here, a little gossip there, some slander over there, yelling in anger over here. I get it. That's just, it seems so small. But what James says is, no, this is a big, 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 huge, hairy deal. It means more than we ever want to admit. And so we've got to stop making excuses for unbridled speech. And we've got to start bridling it. And then we remember that big pink elephant right in the middle of this paragraph. Because obviously what I'm trying to convince you to do is bridle and tame the tongue. But we all know that James just said no human being has ever been able to do that. They've been able to tame the animals and the beasts. But no one's able to tame the tongue. And so now are we being asked to do something we can't do? Yes, we are. Yes, that's exactly what we're being asked to do. But we need to understand we can't do it. Do you know who can? God can. And so you go back to that little metaphor he used of the big giant ship. That big giant ship metaphor, he says, look, the ships are large and they're driven by strong winds and they're guided by a very small rudder. Wherever the will of the pilot directs. If I want my tongue to be tamed, I have to make sure that it's directed by the right pilot. And that pilot is not me. That pilot is Jesus Christ. And yes, it'll be a growth process. No, it's not just a decision today and now everything's great. But what I need to do is turn the control of my mouth over to Jesus. And I need to say Jesus things. I need to say to Jesus, I'm not going to say things unless I know you would be okay with this. And I'm going to ask... In fact, can I just share this with you? It's so interesting to me that he uses this whole notion of the ship being driven by strong winds. And he talks about who's the pilot. Because at the beginning of the book, he had actually used a similar metaphor. He says in chapter 1 and verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, do what? Ask God 
who gives generously to all without reproach and will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Now there's two things here. That word unstable, it's the same word that's used to describe our tongue being a restless evil. I think it's the only other place in Scripture where that word is found. The question is, will we be a wave driven and tossed by the wind? Or will we ask God for wisdom? Will we ask him for direction and leadership and guidance and strength and power so that he will come into our lives and by his will pilot the ship? That's the question we have to ask. Jesus can make people walk on water. And Jesus can tame the tongue. But that's only going to work if we stop making excuses and turn to Jesus and say, all right, this, this, this mouth of mine, it gets to be yours. I must say your stuff. How are you doing at that? If you'd like to go ahead and put your notes away in your Bibles. We're going to sing one more song of blessing and praise. We're going to sing one more song of edification. recognizing the commitment that this song, this blessing that we're doing right now, we want to actually be the kind of thing that defines our entire lives. That, that it's not just what we say here, but we're going to take that with us and we're going to say that kind of stuff everywhere. And then when we talk to people, we're going to talk to them the way we're talking to God. And in so doing, we will be fresh water ponds. The Holy Spirit and his living water bubbling up in our hearts, coming forth, pouring forth life for us and for those around us. But you got to be in Jesus because he's the only one that can take over and control this and pilot and lead you. So my question is, will you give your life over to Jesus this morning? If you're not in Jesus Christ, Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized will be saved. We've got a little tub here that we'll pour some fresh water in. It'll take about seven minutes. And if you'll confess with your tongue that Jesus is Christ, the Son of God, and that you're going to give your life to him, we will bury you down in that fresh water. And we'll bring you up a new living creature in Jesus Christ. If we can help you with that this morning, please come forward right now as we stand and sing.